All right, hello, History 362. So let's talk about what happens after the Second Macedonian War, after the Declaration of Freedom of the Greeks. Um, now, one um, sort of complication to Flamininus's declaration is that the Romans don't leave immediately. So the Declaration of Corinth is in 196. Um, but the Roman uh, stay, Roman armies, and of course Flamininus himself, um, uh, stay um, as affairs are settled in Greece. And indeed, one uh, complication, in addition to the Aetolians being rather unhappy, is Nabus, the king of Sparta, although he's widely considered a tyrant. Um, now, Nabus had um, supported uh, the Roman war effort, um, but had used it as an excuse to launch a military campaign that conquered Argos, um, and actually, Spartan hostility to Argos goes way back to the 6th century BC. Um, and so Nabus, while he's a sort of tyrant and, and his constitutional position isn't particularly um, delicate, um, is accomplishing this sort of ancient Spartan goal of, uh, of, of uh, defeating, conquering, and annexing Argos. And, and Nabus claims that this is his reward for his support of the Roman war effort. Um, now, there's one problem, because Flamininus said, whoa, 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 what part of freedom for the Greek cities didn't you understand? What that meant is each one uh, isn't under occupation, doesn't have a garrison, it doesn't have, uh, have to pay tribute, and it's under its own laws. And being controlled by a Spartan tyrant does not count as being autonomos. Um, uh, so um, uh, Flamininus therefore organizes a coalition of Greek city-states. They contribute troops um, and they uh, join Flamininus's own army. Um, and there is a brisk war between Rome and its Greek allies and Sparta. Um, so I don't know if some of you have ever, uh, you know, uh, you can go on YouTube and find all kinds of weird counterfactual stuff. What, what would it look like if the Romans fought the Spartans? Well, they did. Um, and of course, unsurprisingly, the Romans crushed the Spartans. Nabus and his army is, is no match um, for the Romans. So after some uh, brisk, uh, if, if low-key fighting, um, uh, Nabus uh, surrenders. Um, but the war with Nabus in 195 BC nonetheless extends the presence of Roman troops in Greece. Um, now, meanwhile, the Romans are also turning their diplomatic attentions to Asia. Um, remembering, this is a period where Antiochus the Great, um, who probably in 198, while the Second Macedonian War is raging, um, finally wins the Battle of Panion um, and annexes Coily Syria, um, although the exact date of the Battle of Panion is still contested. It could have been around 200. Um, but at any rate, during the Second Macedonian War, Antiochus the Great is saying, this is awesome, the, the, the Ptolemy, you know, the Romans have stopped Philip, too bad, we're friends, but hey, I'm mopping up. Um, he then decides to turn his attention to Asia. Um, he launches a naval expedition that mops up a series of, uh, of communities along the coast of southern Asia Minor. These seem to have been Ptolemaic possessions or, or, or have had some kind of relation, pro-Ptolemaic um, relations. Um, and then uh, he also, uh, through military operations and, and, and diplomatic gestures, menaces a number of Greek city-states um, in Asia Minor, particularly Smyrna and, and Lampsacus. Um, and uh, uh, these feel that Antiochus is threatening their autonomy, um, and they appeal to the Romans. They're not stupid. They know what's going on. They're probably, well, they are aware of the uh, Declaration of Corinth. Um, and the Roman response is to send uh, ambassadors. At this point, uh, Flamininus, and this is a very common Roman procedure, is um, uh, aided and advised by 10 commissioners, um, uh, 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 legates, legati, um, who um, uh, not only supervise the arrangements that Flamininus is making, but also sort of act as a bunch of, of, of diplomats and ambassadors that can kind of go to where they are needed. Um, and so some of these go to Antiochus, and there are words. Um, uh, they say, you know, when we said, when, 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 when Flamininus, speaking for the people of Rome, so that there was going to be freedom of the Greeks, he didn't just mean the Greeks in Europe, he also meant the Greeks in Asia. Um, you should listen, Antiochus. And Antiochus says, well, that's all very well and nice. 
Um, uh, uh, and again, the, the, the diplomacy is inconclusive. Um, uh, and then the Romans say, oh, and by the way, we would really like it if you left our good friend Ptolemy V, that poor precious child. We'd like it if you left him alone. And Antiochus says, oh, well, don't worry about Ptolemy V. We are at the brink of con uh, concluding a peace, um, and he will marry my daughter, Cleopatra, and uh, he will become my son-in-law. So uh, the diplomacy is basically inconclusive. The Romans throw out threats and demands. Antiochus, who is at this point the last great Hellenistic king standing and at the peak of his power and prestige, says, well, isn't that nice, but who the hell are you? Um, uh, now, uh, it's possible that had the Romans maintained more of a military presence in the east, Antiochus uh, might have been more cautious around them. But um, after 194, the last of the Roman legions leave Greece. They withdraw from the Acro Corinth, and, and actually the Greeks are a little surprised. Like, whoa, when he said freedom for the Greeks, he really meant it. Um, it also means that Antiochus, when he looks over to Greece, thinking, oh, well, what, what, how are the Romans going to enforce their decision, sees zero Roman legionaries or Italian soldiers, um, and probably thinks, well, maybe they weren't all that interested in freedom for the Greeks after all. Um, uh, now, the Roman withdrawal in 194 um, creates the opportunity um, for um, uh, uh, the Aetolians to contemplate a reordering of the settlement of Flamininus, a settlement that they had been very unhappy with. Um, and therefore, it, it takes them a little while, but they, they um, uh, in 192, um, uh, themselves launch a series of military operations. This includes a uh, coup in Sparta, um, where they uh, ultimately actually overthrow and kill Mavis. Um, it involves the Aetolians uh, uh, launching operations against both Calchas and Demetrius. So the Aetolians are now trying to attack and secure two of the fetters of Greece um, that had previously been under Macedonian occupation. And then, having uh, you know, sort of captured some of the key points, they invite, they, they send out a dec uh, declaration and invite Antiochus the Great to come and ensure the freedom for the Greeks, throwing out this same slogan that, as you can see, can be used to describe a wide array of arrangements. Um, Antiochus, um, who may have been caught a little bit by surprise by the Aetolian actions, um, nonetheless feels like this is an offer he can't refuse. This, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a, you know, be a shame. So when you, when you, this is a throw, almost the Aetolians are throwing this down, saying, oh, if you're a great king, we'll prove it. Come to Greece and liberate us. Um, so uh, Antiochus crosses into Greece in 192 um, with a relatively small force, uh, probably only a bit more than 10,000 men. Uh, again, it seems that he's, he's caught by surprise. He may not even have uh, arranged the, the, the shipping that he needs to get his troops across. Um, so he's got a small army. And part of the reason he thinks that he can do with this small army is the Aetolians have basically promised that the Aetolian levy um, will provide uh, a significant uh, military support, and that the Italians will provide the money and supplies that um, he would need to carry out this campaign. And he's a bit disappointed when he gets there um, and discovers, um, oh, there aren't as many Italian soldiers as I would hope, and the Italian material support also disappoints. Um, now, this crossing, uh, there, there had been Factions in Rome that uh, had wanted a war with Antiochus, um, actually going all, all the way back to 194 BC, um, uh, and um, those factions up till now have not went out. But with Antiochus's crossing, um, which now sees and, and Antiochus completely brush aside the Roman settlement, um, the Roman assembly declares war. Um, uh, and so now a war, the, the Romano-Seleucid War, or as the Romans call it, the Syrian War, different from our Syrian wars between the Seleucids and Ptolemies, but from the Roman perspective, the Syrian War um, commences. Um, now, uh, uh, Antiochus um, pretty quickly manages to alienate Philip V. And remember, the Seleucids and the Macedonian, Antigonids of Macedonia, have been friends for, it's a dynastic friendship. Um, and Philip V and Antiochus have had their own secret pact. So these are not people who have a lot of personal enmity. Um, but it seems that Antiochus begins to envision a world where he pushes Philip V aside and puts his own candidate 
on the Macedonian throne. And the, the uh, candidate is this guy who has a ludicrous manufactured claim to, to sort of being descended from Alexander, um, uh, not, not even from Macedonia, it's Greek. Um, but he, he sort of walks around talking big talk, and Antiochus allows this guy to go and bury the dead from Kunos Kephali. This is actually kind of grisly to think about. The dead of Kunos Kephali have been lying there, um, uh, we're in 192 now, they've been lying there since 197 for five years. The bodies of the Macedonian soldiers who fell have been left there, stripped, exposed, rotting, and their skeletons bleaching as really a dramatic statement of Roman power. If you go by there on the road in Thessaly, you will see this monument to what the Romans can do if you cross them. Um, and of course, the fact that Philip is unable to bury his own soldiers is, is unquestionably a, 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 a shame for, for a Macedonian king to be unable to recover and properly bury those remains. So Antiochus allows this, uh, this guy um, to uh, do it, to finally go and bury the dead at Kunis Kephali. Um, this seems to be a pretty bold statement that Antiochus is willing to support a pretender um, to the Macedonian throne. And of course, this alienates Philip dramatically. There was, a, there was a possibility that Philip might have said, hey, you know, if Antiochus will restore me and my kingdom to our former power, I'd be willing to support him. Now he's like, no way. And Philip throws his support behind the Romans. So in this instance, we now have uh, Rome allied with Philip V. Carthage, which had been defeated by the Romans, also sends ships to join the Roman war effort, one of the very small number of ships that Carthage has. Um, and so uh, this is this is basically a coalition of former Roman enemies are now backing Rome. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the uh, war actually goes pretty swift. But now, uh, with the exception of the Achaean, sorry, the Aetolians are backing Philip. Sorry, backing, excuse me, the Aetolians are backing Antiochus, um, uh, uh, the Achaeans are on the Roman side. Um, now, the Romans respond quickly and decisively. They send a consular army of over 23,000 men under the command of one Achilles Glabrio, the, the consul. Um, Glabrio uh, crosses the Adriatic, works his way uh, across into Greece, and here Antiochus has a real problem. He hasn't brought enough troops, he doesn't have enough soldiers, um, and so um, he decides to do what many armies in the past have decided to do when they are trying to defend Greece without an adequate number of troops, and that is try to hold the pass at Thermopylae. This is what uh, uh, Leonidas and his 300 Spartans had tried to do when they didn't have enough troops to actually try to stop the Persians. Um, now, we all know how that ended with, for Leonidas and his 300 Spartans. They were cut off, defeated, and massacred. Um, and Antiochus hopes that he won't suffer the same fate, in part because he hopes that he can block the main pass at Thermopylae with his heavy phalanx, and that the Aetolians can defend the pass. Um, too bad for him, uh, the Romans uh, have likely read their Herodotus, um, and they basically reenact the Battle of 480. They, uh, the main Roman force, commanded by Achilles Glabrio, attacks through the narrows, the, where, the, where the, the steep cliffs coming off of Mount Calodromos uh, uh, meet the ocean. Um, uh, if you visit Thermopylae today, you'll notice that the narrows aren't there anymore because the Mount Gulf has receded, and there's now a huge plain that could fit tens of thousands of soldiers, but back into the day, it's still a narrow pass between the very steep mountains and the, uh, the Gulf. Um, so the main Roman force confronts the Seleucid phalanx. Um, the Seleucids have also built a wall upon which they've installed some uh, siege weaponry that they're shooting at the Romans. Um, but two flying columns of 2,000 men apiece of Roman soldiers managed to work their way at, uh, through the night on the goat paths. One gets lost, but the other one comes out chases away the Aetolians and springs a trap and uh, uh, the um, defeats and kills uh, uh, most of the Seleucid force. Um, uh, and Antiochus himself has to run away, um, uh, disgraced. Um, now, interestingly enough, he brings with him a wife that he has married, um, uh, uh, a wife that he has given the name of Uboa. She's a, she's a daughter of a local worthy in Calchas. Um, and it seems that Antiochus had married her as a way of both showing his commitment to the Greeks 
and also perhaps as a way of announcing the annexation of the island. It's quite likely her name wasn't initially Uboa, um, but he sort of gives her this name perhaps to mark um, the annexations that he plans for both Uboa and possibly for other parts of Greece. Didn't work out very well, but he flees with her, um, uh, gets on a boat, goes back to Ephesus. Um, now, uh, with the destruction of the um, uh, uh, Seleucid expeditionary force, um, to a new consul, Lucius Scipio, arrives. Um, a, uh, Achilles Gladrio stays behind as a proconsul to pursue a war against the Aetolians. Um, the Aetolians pretty quickly try to negotiate terms. They realize that they are toast. Um, uh, but the negotiations don't go well, in part because of a misunderstanding that the Aetolian envoys have with Glabria. They um, offer to give themselves into the faith of the Roman people. And here they probably are mistranslating a Roman term, deditio in fido, uh, which uh, basically means a, a surrender into the faith of the Roman people. But for the Romans, this is a unconditional surrender, whereby everything that you have, your community, your houses, your farms, your fields, your walls, your, your, your family, all become property of the Roman state. Um, and the Romans, some can, if they want, turn around and say, well, thanks for giving everything you have to us. We're going to give most of it back. That's the unconditional surrender to the Romans, the DTO and Fidem. Uh, the Aetolians seem to misunderstand what that means and think that they are sort of just accepting the good faith of the Roman people rather than an absolute unconditional surrender. And to, to explain to them what that means, uh, Gladrio famously says, bring me some chains. And he, in, during the course of this negotiation, chains up the Italian envoys and says, this is what a didio in fidem is. This is what you just did. Um, and he eventually, you know, his, his handlers come and say, oh, I just can't do this. Take, you know, uh, uh, so he uncuffs them and lets them go. But um, uh, this, is, this is also a sign that sometimes, while the Romans are happy to embrace a lot of Greek slogans and diplomatic language, sometimes there is still a disconnect between how the Romans view the world, diplomacy, and how the Greeks do it. Um, Deditio and fidem means unconditional, absolute surrender. Um, the Aetolians actually therefore decide they're going to continue the war. Um, uh, however, uh, uh, by uh, 189, uh, Ambracia is captured and sacked, bringing many works of Greek art uh, to, uh, back to Rome, um, and the, the Aetolians do indeed um, uh, finally surrender, defeat it. Um, now, in, uh, the, 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 if the Romans are going to want to invade into Asian Minor to bring the war closer to Antiochus, um, uh, they first need to achieve naval superiority. Because the Seleucids, Antiochus has actually built a large blue water fleet. Um, and this is done through an alliance with Rhodes. Again, uh, Rhodes, uh, formerly a big Ptolemaic ally, and now that the Ptolemies are gone, look to Rome as a potential um, uh, partner, maybe even savior. Um, so finally, a Roman and Rhodian fleet succeeds in engaging and defeating the Seleucid fleet off the coast of Myonisus, the Battle of Myonisus, um, in, uh, in 191. Um, and with the Seleucid fleet defeated, the Romans can now uh, risk crossing over into Asia Minor. Um, they're aided by the fact that Philip V has built roads and bridges and basically created a kind of highway for the Romans to march through Macedonia and Thrace um, until they can get on boats and cross over um, the Hellespont. Um, so Lucius Scipio, who is the brother of Scipio Africanus, the guy who defeated Hannibal, is in command. Scipio Africanus joins his brother as a legate, although he's ill for the final battle. Hannibal, incidentally, is also a part of this war. He has been exiled from Carthage. He goes to Tyre, a community in Koilu, Syria that is now under the Seleucid, under Seleucid control, um, and he enters into the Seleucid court. He wants to become a friend, a philos of Antiochus the Great. And even though Hannibal is without question the most talented captain in antiquity, Antiochus seems to be a bit suspicious of him and maybe also worried that Hannibal might upstage him as a general and commander. So, Rather, you know, you might say, well, if Hannibal there wants to command an army, give him an army, let him fight the Romans. Um, Antiochus doesn't do this. He says, well, you know, Hannibal, um, would you like to uh, be an admiral? Um, and Hannibal is given a fleet. Maybe this makes sense. It's quite likely that a lot of the sailors in the Seleucid fleet are Phoenician, so there's some linguistic uh, connections. 
Um, Hannibal, however, is an only a, a mediocre admiral, and he doesn't accomplish much um, at all. Um, so the final battle takes place at Nymesia uh, Cyplium uh, in Asia Minor. Um, after some shadow boxing, Lucius Scipio uh, conf uh, is sort of positioned in between two rivers. Um, one thing is now the numerical advantage is on the Seleucid side, um, because Antiochus the Great can bring, uh, he's assembled a huge army, um, he's got local lines of supply, and of course he can recruit locally also from all of the uh, communities and, and regions that he now controls in Asia Minor. So he has 72,000 men um, against uh, around 30,000 on the Roman side, um, a consular army of two legions and two allied wings, about 20,000 Roman infantry. Um, and more importantly, there's some like, Achaeans who have come along, and also cavalry, about 800 cavalry from Pergamon, um, uh, commanded by the new king of Pergamon, Eumenes II. Um, and these are going to prove decisive. Uh, and indeed, Eumenes is given command of all of the cavalry, 800 uh, Adelaide cavalry and, and uh, 2,200 Roman cavalry. Um, so uh, Antiochus has a huge army. He's got his big phalanx. Uh, he's got his heavy cataphracts. He's got war, uh, war elephants. Um, and the battle starts when Antiochus, charging with his uh, heavy cavalry, including his cataphracts, manages to drive a wedge um, between uh, the Roman army and its attempt to sort of... Uh, tie its flank into one of the riverbanks, and he actually manages to push half the Roman army back almost to the ramparts of its camp. And actually, here the fleeing Roman soldiers are aided by the uh, mercenaries, the Thracian and Macedonian mercenaries that Philip V has allowed them to recruit um, and to take with them. Um, uh, so the, uh, the sort of Roman left is at this point hard-pressed by the charge of Antiochus's heavy cavalry, However, and this may sound familiar, um, on the right, things are not going well. Um, the uh, Seleucids have tried to attack with some scythe chariots. These things never work. And the retreat of the scythe chariots have, because uh, the, 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 the Romans have hired Cretan archers, and they just pick the, dri the riders off, the, or the drivers off of the chariots. And the retreat of these scythe chariots have spooked the Seleucid cavalry, who were there in huge numbers. And uh, Eumenes II seems to realize that now is the moment to attack because the Seleucid cavalry is disrupted, the horses themselves may be kind of panicky. And so a well-timed attack, uh, attack of the Adelaide and Roman cavalry completely smashes up all of the Seleucid cavalry on the Seleucid uh, left flank. Um, and Eumenes has the good sense to not keep chasing them, but to turn around and flank the Seleucid phalanx in the center. So Seleucid phalanx is now pinned between the, the Adelaide and Roman cavalry and the Roman legions. Um, too late, Antiochus, who thinks he's winning, who thinks he's close to capturing the Roman camp, looks over and realizes that he has lost. Um, and again, he retreats, although a huge number of his army is destroyed. Um, uh, we, the, the casualties that were given are 50,000 uh, uh, dead, which is probably too high, but it's quite likely that, that initially Antiochus uh, has very few of his soldiers um, uh, available as he tries to reconstitute them. Um, Antiochus now still has a huge realm. He could still fall back and try to keep fighting. Um, uh, and it's quite likely that even, even with the soldiers that he has left, he may still outnumber the Romans. Um, but he's lost a lot of face. This is a devastating situation for a Hellenistic king whose ideological claim is victory to be in because he's been losing again and again and again. His army has been defeated at Thermopylae in a battle he personally commanded. His navy has been crushed at Myonesos. Now he's personally commanded another debacle. Um, and we're told by Appian um, that there are murmurs in his court, complaints about how poorly he's planned the battle, about his over-reliance on green troops, um, on, on stacking his, his numerically superior force uh, far too deep. Um, and it's quite likely he realizes that rumors like this and murmurings, um, if, they're, if, if the losing continues, can lead to an assassination. He should realize that. This is what happened to his brother, Lucas III, who was assassinated um, while commanding an army uh, up in Asia Minor. Um, and so Antiochus decides it's best to cut his losses. 
Um, he enters into negotiations with the Romans. Uh, the key negotiator is now Scipio Africanus, who missed the battle. His, his brother uh, fought it and won it, but Scipio Africanus steps forward to be the point person for negotiations. Um, and a treaty is hashed out that is formally signed in uh, 188 BC. This is the Treaty of Apamea. Some standard Roman uh, uh, requirements. The Seleucids have to give up their navy, except for a handful of ships. They can't have a war elephant herd. They are not allowed to recruit mercenaries from Asia Minor. And also they must give up, this is the most devastating clause, they must give up um, all of their territory um, north of the Taurus Mountains. This means Antiochus III surrenders Asia Minor um, to the Romans, who notably don't keep it. Uh, the Romans don't establish a province in Asia Minor. Rather, they divide most of this territory between their two most loyal allies. Um, Rhodes gets a huge amount of territory in Caria, and uh, Pergamon gets almost the rest, which means Pergamon goes from being a city-state with a kind of uh, you know, modest hinterland um, to being a huge Hellenistic kingdom that encompasses a significant portion of all of Western Asia Minor. Um, finally, uh, Antiochus and his descendants need to pay the Romans an indemnity um, this will be um, uh, 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 3,000 talents up front, um, and then an installment of, of 1,000 talents a year for 12 years. 1,000 talents is a huge amount of money, um, even by the standards of a Hellenistic kingdom, or certainly by the standards of the Roman Republic. Um, uh, so uh, uh, this is the uh, agreement that Antiochus agrees to, a devastating end to what had been one of the most successful reigns for a Seleucid king. Um, and Antiochus himself is killed the next year in 187 BC in, in, a, in the most ignominious way. He seems that he's going on another Eastern anab anabasis, probably to both reestablish control of his always tenuously controlled Eastern kingdom, um, probably to reestablish his badly uh, battered royal prestige, and also it seems he needs the money to pay the Romans. Um, he pauses in a temple in Elam, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the highlands, um, uh, and uh, in, it seems that he tries to sack it, um, yeah, sacking a, a, a temple in his own territory, possibly on the uh, argument they, they owe the Seleucids back taxes. Um, and in sacking the temple, the natives, the Elamites, come and fight back, and he's killed in the fighting. So Antiochus is killed in 187, um, uh, and a, um, he's going to be succeeded by his son, Seleucus IV. Um, but uh, uh, suffice it to say, um, the Roman War represents a devastating blow to Antiochus the Great and his Seleucid Empire. Um, all right, we will go on and talk more next time about um, uh, the Third Macedonian War and the end of the Antigonid dynasty.